I'm Mark Boris and this is Straight Talk. How do you want to live the last 10 years of your life? This is a question I'm asking myself a lot lately and one Louisa Nicola is thinking about as well. The brain, pretty much like the federal government of the body. That's a worry. Yeah. <laughs> She's a clinical neurophysiologist and the founder of Neuroathletics. We help high performers gain that extra edge. Oh, LeBron James! To LeBron, that could mean the difference between $22 million or $122 million. Most of us think about our brain as somewhere we just where we have thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> None of us really think of it as something that might allow us to do something better. Sleep is the most underrated high performance tool that we have. Imagine not sleeping well for five years straight. It's all just going to compound. And then eventually this then leads to neuronal death. We're literally walking ourselves into neurodegenerative diseases through lack of sleep, lack of proper nutrition and lack of physical activity. You can walk yourself into disease states or you can walk yourself out of them. How am I living my life? And is there something I can do to improve my future? If you can train it and you can work on it, you can really achieve anything you want. Louisa Nicola. Correct. Welcome to Straight Talk. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, and we're lucky to get you because you're off to the States, I think, tomorrow. Correct. Or back to the States. Back to the States and then back again for Christmas. An Aussie girl living in the States mm, and York. running a business in the States. Correct. And you're in New York. Yeah. So you're the high end of, of the US. So you, you don't muck around. You go straight to the top. I went straight there, yeah. So why did you go to the States? I mean, that's a big market to take on. Mm. Exactly that reason. That reason. That reason. So... I was a, a triathlete here in Australia and that gave me my first thirst and hunger of what it means to perform at your peak. And in 2016, I was asked to actually go to LA and present and this was for the high performance team of Red Bull. So I went there and that was my first time ever in the US and I saw what was over there compared to Australia. I, I definitely say that they are 10 years in front of the Australian market when it comes to science, research, technology. And I got my first thirst of that life and I thought, I have to be here. You were a triathlete, like a competitive triathlete is what you're saying? So, yeah, I competed for Australia in the Australian team and uh, I qualified for Beijing, London and Auckland. And what happened was two weeks prior to going to Beijing. This was like back in, I think it was 2009, I had a car accident. So I uh, had a, broke my leg, broke a few bones. And so I had to forfeit my title. And it was, yeah, it was really devastating at the time. Was this a career sort of move? Were you thinking to yourself, this could be a career for me? I yeah, correct. I could make correct. money out of being a, a triathlete. Yeah, so I had done my undergraduate degree at university. I was already. Already. Yep. Um, and then this happened and it completely put a spanner in the works. I thought this was going to be my career. And that's when everything changed. And this is where I started to learn about the brain. I started to learn about the brain being the command centers, pretty much like the federal government of the body. It, that's a worry. Yeah. <laughs> Currently, well, I know, all the time. It controls everything we do. And we never learned this in school. And we, you know, this is back in 2009. We really didn't understand too much about the brain. We didn't have access to free education. And I became utterly obsessed about the brain and understanding how can I get back on the bike by training my brain. You mean literally? Literally back on the bike. So had you lost use of your legs or something that wasn't working? Yeah, I had to get I had to get surgery. Um, I corrected that, but I was out for about three months. And that's really devastating for someone who was training 40 hours a week to just have it cut. So I had a lot of time to think, what am I going to do with my life? And I decided I'm going to go back to university. I want to study medicine. I want to study the brain. And it was in 2016 that I started my company, Neuro Athletics, which is literally the intersection of neuroscience and high performance. So just explain to me how that those two things connect. Mm. When I was training, all we knew was do more and be better. Just train more, be better. Whereas what we know now is that doing a bit less may be better. For example, we never got taught anything about nutrition. We didn't get any education around sleep, we actually got taught sleep less just so you can get on the bike more. And now that I understand 
the brain and how it controls everything we do. Our nervous system literally controls everything from the way we think to the way we act to our emotions to the way we move. If you can train it and you can work on it, you can really achieve anything you want. So when I talk about athletes, I'm not just talking about NBA players, tennis players. I'm talking about every single person. Every single person has a brain and we can we can be our own athletes if we want. So when you talk about the brain or maybe I could say when you talk about the nervous system, you talk about both. Because when you talk about nervous system, I think of something running down my arms to my fingers, tips or whatever. But then when I think of my brain, I think of things sitting in my head. But I, I know a little bit about it in that they're both one and the same. They're, there's just an extension of each other, so to speak. Correct. So so what do you mean by that brain, nervous system? And what are we talking about here? So you and I both have something very wonderful. It's called the nervous system. Mm. And it's split into two. So we have the central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord. And then we have the peripheral nervous system. And they are the nerves that come off the spinal cord and connect to our peripheries. So that's – and then the peripheral nervous system is then – cut into two that's going into the uh, the autonomic nervous system and so that's what I mean when I talk about the nervous system. And effectively, as I understand it, is so the brain's sending, it's receiving messages but it's also sending messages all the time so it's pushing and pulling data from various, from from say from senses, your fingers or your eyes or your yeah. sense of smell, whatever it is, and, but then it's sending commands back to yeah. do something. That's actually, a, that's actually a phenomenon in neuroscience called top-down processing and bottoms up, meaning that we have our brain that sends signals down the spinal cord out. Okay. So that is top down processing. Then we have bottoms up, which is the sensory information that we gain from the outside environment, pain, temperature, touch, which sends signals from our skin or our fingertips up into the brain, into different areas of the brain. Neuroathletics, which is your business, how have you blended what you studied yeah. what you've experienced in terms of the accident of your own recovery. How have you blended that into neuroathletics and what does neuroathletics do? So essentially we help high performers, athletes and organisations gain that extra edge. But Mark, what we really believe in is that the greatest insurance policy that a human can have is a well-performing brain. So we exist to provide the best insurance policies worldwide. So what does that mean? Well-performing so, brain means in terms of the whole lot, though. Correct, yes. Yeah, well-performing brain, system, nervous system, yeah, yeah, et cetera. Yeah. You know, I think, um, I think we've been really miseducated because we all go through a natural brain aging process. Our brain is fully developed at the age of 25 and from there, just due to the natural aging process, we have so many things that happen that we just do not, we're not aware of. And when we go into corporate organizations, for example, we have a front end system to neuroathletics and a back end system. So I'll go in or one of my staff members will go in and we will complete a workshop. Okay, for in example, an organization. In an organization. Let's take IBM, which is one of our biggest yep. clients. Uh, we'll go in, we'll do a workshop with their C-suite or their sales team. And after that, they do the back end, which is literally a, a library of digital products that they get access to. And it's all based on different areas of brain health. We may do sleep, nutrition, exercise, how they can understand each and every one of these domains to better their own performance. As individuals. Like, as individuals yeah, so and as teams. Most of us think about our brain as somewhere we just where we have thoughts yeah. <laughs> or we have understandings of, of or comprehension of things that are happening. But ne none of us really think of it as um, something that might allow us to do something better, um, like live better, feel better, work better. What is your objective though when you're talking to these individuals? And probably more importantly, what's IBM's objective in mm. getting you to talk to their C-suite? Yeah, it's uh, it's quite interesting because we always talk to them before and we say, well, what are, the, what are some of the biggest challenges that your team is currently having? And it always – always, Louisa, there's just stress. They've got burnout. They're taking time off. It's costing us X amount of dollars per year because they're taking so much time off. Can you come in, just talk to them about wellness practices or high performance practices that they can embed daily so we don't get burnout, so they don't get stressed, so they don't have a, a short fuse. Because what ends up happening, there's this matrix that we've come up with. What ends up happening is you get the stressed out employee. This stressed out employee has 
bad time management skills, which ends up leading to more stress. This stress then leads to poor communication, decreased information processing speed, decreased decision-making skills. That then leads to a missed sale or arguing with a coworker or taking time off. That then, what does that do to the bottom line of a company? It yeah. doesn't increase it. So, But how does someone like IBM know that to seek your service? I mean, what is it that IBM know that we don't know? Like, Well, I think so – the way that they actually sought me out was it all comes down to social media. I produce a lot of content uh, weekly and uh, it just so happened that the VP of sales of IBM saw me and was really intrigued and thought, I really like this girl. Let's see what she's about. And that's pretty much what started it. And from IBM went to Bloomberg, from Bloomberg went to- In the States you're talking about? In the States yep. I'm talking about. And from Bloomberg then went into Major League Baseball, then went into NBA. And so that was the entire like catalyst for neuroathletics growth. If they retain your service, you, you don't just go and have a chat to them. No. Um, say, you know, hey guys, or do you do then one-on-ones and then you do give them like not homework, but like, you know, some curriculum or syllabus that they have to try and do some stuff on, some work on? Well, that's a good question. At the start, what we were initially doing was just going in and doing our signature program, which was a two hour workshop because these companies don't have more time to dedicate. I would love it to be a five hour workshop. So from that, we just had an influx of messages. Can we do more? Can you give us more? So this is why we opened up the suite of digital products. So we now have a library with hundreds of videos where these employees now have a lifetime access to all of these videos. It may be a five minute video on different sleep stages, what they are, why exercise is good for brain health, uh, nutrition, why you should be supplementing with omega-3 fatty acids. I think that at the core of everything is education. Education. If you have the correct education, everything comes down to you, right? If you understand what's holding you back, what is detrimental to your brain, then you can understand what not to do. Uh, I mean, I love this topic of burnout um, because I don't really know what it means, but Everyone's got a different definition of it and it's pretty subjective, I guess, in respect of any one individual. But what are the signs of burnout and what should an employee and or employer be looking for if if there's a cohort of people suffering from burnout? What are, what are the signs? Yeah, emotionally stressed first and foremost. So they're not able to manage their emotions. I, of, I often describe this as someone who's got uh, you light a match and that's their ability to just fire up, okay? Okay. Um, they're starting to call in sick. You can see them starting to, they kind of look a bit sad. They kind of look a bit bad. They're starting to stress and then they're starting to take time off. And then out of nowhere, if that's not addressed, they either end up quitting or they take a leave of absence, which is really big for a company to take on. You can imagine um, how many employees at these large organizations, like I'm talking like two, 300,000 employees. Imagine them all taking a leave of absence for a week. You know, I can't imagine them managing. And during the COVID period, which obviously you've experienced, was this burnout more prevalent or is it more prevalent now? Uh, I love that you said that and I've got some stats to show you. Yep. Okay. So there was a Deloitte study done. It was post-COVID. It showed that 42% of employees, this is US employees. In which period are we talking about? Post-COVID. Post, so this post is COVID 2021. Now. Okay. Okay. The Deloitte okay. study yep. came out. 42% of employees felt burnt out. 83% felt emotionally drained. And 60% of C-suite execs have reported high anxiety. Why is this? We're actually seeing this now in Australia. I've heard that there is a lot of employees, especially during this tax season. This, this is yep, in the yep. States. But now moving into Australia during tax season. So we go into a lot of hedge funds and I work personally with portfolio managers on Wall Street. And I can see the amount of anxiety and stress that they go through. I've had one, I've had one guy say to me, Louise, I literally, I've got the weight of you know, 10, 15 families who have trusted me with their money. If I make one wrong decision, I can take away everything that they own. That's a lot. It's a lot of stress. What do you then say to the uh, proprietor? We'll go into the three domains that we usually speak about. And I never say what people should do. I'm also provide the education. So let's first talk about sleep. I mean, sleep, I think, is the most underrated high performance tool that we have. And unfortunately, a lot of people in Australia and in the US are just not sleeping well, we're getting anywhere from what, six to seven hours of sleep per night. You're probably one of them unless you sleep more. You- no, uh, it depends. It's, uh, I can I can get by in seven hours is probably my, 
where I want to be. Okay. Sleep. But a proper sleep. In terms of brain function and quality of life, sleep is definitely something that every single person should be prioritizing. Okay. Why is that? What, what, what does sleep do in terms of my brain? I, you know, I listen to the Hoopman podcast on these very topics, like yeah. sleep, for example. Um, what does that do to my brain? What does it do for my brain? Why is it so important? Yeah. So love this question. First and foremost, I'll just take you through a debrief of what sleep is. So we have four stages. We have stage one. Okay. And that is when we're falling asleep. Stage two, light sleep. Stage three is called deep sleep. Then we have stage four and that's REM sleep. Now during deep sleep, and this is a really critical stage. How many hours into the sleeping? This is around hour three. Right, through the third hour, yeah. Yeah, and it really is dependent, but that's generally when it is. So deep non-REM sleep, so it's not rapid eye movement sleep. Two specific things happen during this stage. The first thing is we get the secretion of a lot of hormones. You're a man, you get all of your testosterone and growth hormone release in that time. Women, growth hormone and also estrogen. There's a lot of men who are not getting into those deep sleep stages. And what tends to happen is they get, uh, they, don't ha- they don't have a lot of testosterone release. This is characterized by so-called man boobs and um, male hip fat. Mm. Okay. So that's the first thing that happens. A critical stage is hormone secretion. The next stage, the next critical thing that happens is we have this wonderful system. It's like a sewage system in the brain and it gets activated during deep sleep. It's called the glymphatic system. You've probably heard of lymphatic system. It's the same thing that happens in your brain. But what happens is as soon as you get into deep sleep, we have glial cells. It comes from the Greek word glue and they surround our neurons, which is a nerve cell. What tends to happen is they shrink in size during deep, deep sleep. When they shrink, our cerebral spinal fluid goes through and washes out all of the debris and toxins throughout the brain. So debris and toxins such as amyloid beta. Now, amyloid beta is one of the hallmarks to Alzheimer's disease. So if we're not getting the clearing out of these toxins, there's other toxins too, such as tau proteins and other things, if we're not cleaning out our brain, we're going to be waking up every day with maybe brain fog, irritability, I know you're a fan of compound interest. This is exactly what happens in the brain. Imagine not sleeping well for five years straight. It's all just going to compound. And then eventually this then leads to neuronal death, the death of brain cells over time. So sleep is absolutely crucial for that reason. The second reason is stage four sleep, which is rapid eye movement sleep. During this sleep, this is where we get a lot of our emotional first aid, That's what REM sleep is, emotional first aid and memory consolidation. You want to have this. If you want to have great EQ or emotional health, you need to be getting into sleep. And I'm just going to finish off by saying there's a wonderful study done. It was produced in PNAS, which is a high stringent journal. What they did was they took a group of healthy men around the age of 40 to 45 years old, and they sleep deprived them to six hours of sleep for one week. Per night. Per night, only for one week. And these were healthy adults with no complaints, no health issues. What ended up happening was they saw a 3% change in their genome. So we have 20,000 genes in the human genome. What they found was 711 genes were changed just due to sleep deprivation of six hours or less. Now, the genes that were changed, half of those 711 half of them were upregulated, okay? And those genes were the tumor-producing genes. So they were upregulated. The genes responsible for immunity were downregulated. So that is really scary. So then you're talking about... You're talking about disease states such as cardiovascular disease and cancers just due to sleep deprivation alone. So that's why it's critically important. And then, of course, it's important for uh, cognitive functions such as thinking, uh, information processing speed, the four stages of sleep. When you say sleep well, yeah, does that mean it's an uninterrupted sleep? In other words, you don't wake up at all? Yeah, that's polyphasic sleep. We don't want that. We generally, your brain really wants consistency first and foremost, and it really wants to just sleep throughout the night. But here's the thing. A lot of people think, are thinking that they're sleeping 
when in actual fact they're not. Now, here are the two biggest things that kick you out of sleep. The first one is alcohol. Alcohol is a sedative. The active ingredient in alcohol, which is ethanol, is a sedative. So it's not putting you to sleep. It's actually sedating you. So if you're thinking I'm going to have a glass of wine or I'm going to have a beer and it pretty much calms me down, you're sedating yourself. So that's not sleep. So that's the first thing that kicks you out of it. So that's a myth. That's a good one. Yeah. Then we've got light exposure. We know that light coming in through our eyes activates a system that tells our brain, hey, we're awake. So that decreases the amount of melatonin that is produced. So it's going to keep us awake at night as well. So that's another thing. Um, And then you know, at the end of the day, it's just total sleep time. Some people are just not sleeping long enough. What about if you, you know, you get to my age, you get to get up and take a leak all the time. Yeah. I mean, is it around 4 a.m.? No, it's uh, 1 a.m. You know, it's, it can be, but no, it's not It's not that far into the night, well, not that far advanced into the night. It's much earlier in the night. But it, it, that sort of obviously wakes you up. But, yeah. It, but it, I don't wake up actually. I'm, I'm sort of half wake up asleep, but I go back to sleep. But does that um, deter my or does that sort of impact on my deep sleep? Well, it depends on what you do. So there is a lot of men over the age of 70 who I'm not saying that that's how old you are. I'm just saying statistically that wake up at around 4am to go to the bathroom and that's just a natural aging. But it actually, so instead of saying, how do you stop that? You think about, well, what are you doing during that time? If you're going and switching on all the lights, you've just that is just completely. I don't even open my eyes. I don't think somehow managed to get there without making open my eyes up. Oh, well, that would be an interesting night for you then. Yeah, well, I know the way. I know the route so well. Like, okay, yeah. I, I even know how many steps it is. So like I've counted the steps. and Yeah. So that's, you know, that's one thing. Um, oftentimes people are just running out of melatonin. melatonin. Well, I, I want to talk about melatonin if you don't yeah. mind. Um, because, you know, like uh, there's a big discussion about melatonin and um, I have a mate who's a doctor and he says that this is before, you know, when you're over a certain age, you can go and get melatonin, two milligrams of melatonin, like at the chemist. You mm. don't have to have a prescription. But prior to that, you used to have a prescription. And I said to him, you know, I wasn't sleeping perfectly at the time. It's a couple of years ago and he, he started, uh, he prescribed me 10 milligrams of melatonin. Oh, know. wow. Yeah, t- totally. And uh, it was made by a compounding chemist. And, uh, yeah, but I found I was like, it was really, really buggered in the morning. Like, it's really tired, you know. And, uh, and then so I did a little bit of research on it. Hooverman again and others and uh, I came back and they're all talking about two milligrams. So I went back on two milligrams. I went on to two milligrams. Does melatonin, what does it do? Does it make you go to sleep or does it help you stay? What's it supposed to do? Okay, so first, uh, this is such a controversial topic and I love talking about it. So first of all, it's a nat- melatonin is a naturally secreting hormone. So it gets it's our sleepiness hormone and it gets released in response to darkness. So right now we haven't got any circulating melatonin because we've got a lot of light coming in through our retina. So when the sun goes down and when you turn off the lights, your brain is saying, okay, let's produce melatonin to make us sleepy. So there's a little structure in the brain called the pineal gland. So it starts to push out melatonin that makes us sleepy. What's happening is we are now taking exogenous forms of melatonin and that is really disrupting us. And the reason why I'm semi, I would say semi against it is because it's a hormone. It is not just a vitamin. It is a hormone. It's just like saying, well, why are we not all taking testosterone or estrogen over the counter? In America, you can get it over the counter. So what we're doing is we're dosing up and it's making us just fall asleep. But what's happening is it's telling our pineal gland to just keep excreting, excreting. And what happens is you end up waking up. It's telling the pineal gland, which is sometimes referred to as the third eye, but it's telling the pineal gland to actually produce melatonin. More, but you're also taking it as well. You're also putting it in. Exactly. So you've got so much circulating. So you just completely get knocked out. But then what happens is you end up running out faster. So you end up waking up. And that's a really big, one of the chief complaints of people who take melatonin is, oh, Louisa, I took five milligrams and I, I woke up at 3 a.m. That happens to me too if I end up taking it. So my advice is definitely just obviously seek a, a medical opinion, but it's there are so many better ways to fall asleep and stay asleep. And they're the two complaints that people have when it comes to sleep. I have trouble falling asleep or I have trouble staying asleep. So if for those of you who are having trouble falling asleep. That's not me. I'm having trouble staying asleep. Yes, okay, and that's the melatonin, okay? But the people who are having trouble falling asleep, that's generally because they've got so much stress happening. Their brain is going 24-7. So these people may do better with supplementing with GABA, 
so gamma amino butyric acid. And this is our chief inhibitory neurotransmitter. So it it inhibits, it stops synaptic transmission. So our brain, when it's firing 24-7, when we're stressed, we need something to calm down our nervous system. And you can take GABA for yeah, that. GABA is just, it's not just, but it's a supplement. Yeah. You just buy it at the- Yeah, you can just buy it good yeah, at the drugstore. Yeah, yeah, yeah correct. Yeah, yeah. You know what they did? Um, they actually did a study in, in the US on melatonin. And what they found was that the labels on these bottles were, they were saying five milligrams, but it actually had a hundred X yeah, that's why it's uh, that's why it's scary. So you may think you're taking five milligrams, but you're taking a hundred times that. Well, like the US, now you can buy melatonin over the counter. If you're over fifty five, you've got to show, you know give me an ID and stuff like that. So in Australia, you can get uh, two milligrams. I think it is that it comes in two milligram tablets. Um, and I've often wondered about it. I mean, it, it is you know doctors will tell you to go and take it if you f- tell the doctor you have trouble sleeping. It's interesting that you would go and so when you go to we keep using IBM, but you, you sit down, you talk to the key executives and for that matter, by the way, it's not just key executives. I'm sure you could talk to every person in the organisation um, and you identify, then you have a long conversation with them about sleep or mm-hmm. rest. Mm-hmm. Do you go into this conversation? Do you go explain why it's important, et cetera? Of course. Yeah, you know, yeah. With this clean out business that you're talking about, you know, Absolutely. various um, uh, things coming out of your spinal fluid, whatever it is, and uh, Mm. cleaning out the debris so that you can wake up nice and fresh in the morning. So you can wake up nice and fresh, but also so you can have a better performing brain. What does that mean? Well, I always do a a neuroanatomy at the start. If you get your right hand, you put it up against your forehead, right there behind your forehead lives your prefrontal cortex. It's an area of the brain. It's the biggest part of our brain, most primitive, and that houses, they basically call it the CEO of the brain. So our frontal lobe, prefrontal cortex, that is responsible for our executive functions. Things such as decision-making, reaction time, the speed at which we process information, that all lives there. If we are having a bad night of sleep, six hours or less, even seven hours or less, we are going to have a decline in these processes. Your ability to think, your ability to take information and process it intelligently and react intelligently to that is going to be decreased. So you really want to be sleeping so you can enhance your daytime performance. Who doesn't want to go to work, especially if you are, if you're having to make these decisions, who doesn't want to go to work being at their peak? That's what that means. Being at your peak is knowing that your brain is functioning optimally, because if it's not, you're just not going to be making the right decisions at work. And what happens when someone puts their hand up and says, I do uh, yoga nidra. Mm. I therefore don't need as much sleep. I'd laugh at them. Is there anything, because, you know, like there's all this sort of legendary bullshit talks about, you know, he lives on, or she lives on four hours sleep a night and therefore she or he gets much more work done than everybody else and is much more productive and has been, and you think, wow, this guy's a superhero. Like, mm. uh, and then the, the individual might say, yeah, but I also do yoga nidra, which, uh, you know, helps me live on less sleep. Is there such a thing? Are there any things that you can do to allow you to live on less sleep because, like, to some extent, sleep's a bit of a waste of time, but it's not a waste of time in a physio- physiological sense, mm-hmm. what you're explaining. Um, but it is a waste of time in that you could be doing other things. You could be working to midnight then getting up again at 4 o'clock in the morning and starting working all over again, yeah. um, which would give you an edge if you wanted to say that I'm doing 20 hours a day work. I'm, I'm not suggesting anyone should do this or does do this, but is there anything you can do to reduce – the need for that amount of sleep or say seven or eight hours or there is nothing, there's no way around there it. There is no, if you work, if you sleep deprive yourself for two, three days, probably not going to do anything to you. But this is a compound effect. It is just like eating a chocolate bar, okay? Maybe the first day won't do anything, but if you keep doing this day in and day out, you're probably going to put on weight dependent mm. of your output of, of physical activity. Another thing to point out is sleep is not like a debt that you can repay like at a bank. You can't sleep for six hours on Monday night, six hours on Tuesday night, and then think I'll backload and then on Wednesday night or on the weekends, I'll sleep 12 hours. It just doesn't work like that. Your brain loves consistency. Your brain isn't there to make you successful. It's there to keep you alive. So if you are not treating it well, it will treat you poorly. And we can see that. You know, the rate of Alzheimer's disease, 50 million people worldwide are affected by dementia. And that is scary. And 
by dementia, I mean Alzheimer's disease. And that number is said to triple by the year 2050. One of the biggest drivers of Alzheimer's disease outside of the ApoE4 gene, which it's a genetic disorder, outside of that is lifestyle factors, lack of sleep, number one lack of exercise, proper exercise, number two, and number three, lack of proper uh, nutrition. I have a friend um, who's a kidney specialist in Australia at a very well-known hospital and um, his father was a an immunologist. His father was a professor, Very, his father was like a legend in uh, the medical world. And uh, his father at uh, his, I know them very well. I knew his because his father was a client of mine when I was in the law firm. And uh, his his dad, um, every day, would walk up the stairs at this particular hospital, like eight flights of stairs because they're on the eighth level, and it was like slim, uh, really looked after himself. Not a drinker, quite a, a high intellect, etc. Very well read. You know, he, he exercised his brain all the time, um, and. Uh, Nutritionally, probably was pretty good. He was pretty clued in. And at 82, his father was still working. His father got dementia mm. and uh, and ultimately died some couple of years after. And I said to his son, I said, uh, are you worried that you might have the genetic mutation for dementia? Have, have you bothered to go and get a checked genetic test? And he said to me, well, it's prob- I had a reason for asking this because my mother died from motor neuron disease and I was actually interested in getting the, the, the test for that to see whether I had any of the one of the hundred mutations in the various categories that have been so far pinpointed for uh, as being um, overlaid mm. for, for motor neuron disease. And he said to me, well, I haven't done that. And he said, the reason I haven't done that is because there's probably no point in doing it because all that they're going to say to me is, well, what you should do is go into um, – you shouldn't – You've got the you've got the mutation. Therefore, what you should do is do vigorous exercise um, in, in terms of high intensity. And he said, "So I figured, what's the point of getting anxious about something that I'll now find out that I'll be looking over my shoulder for the rest of my life, when in fact all they're going to ask me to do is high intensity exercise? So I might as well go and do the high intensity exercise anyway and not know about it. Um, so exercise." seems to be a common denominator Oh yeah. in terms of overall health, brain health in particular, nutrition, rest and exercise. Mm-hmm. What is it that exercise does that's so important? You know, Mark, I've talked to, so I have a podcast where I interview the world's leading scientists and um, doctors in different areas and, and I'm very fascinated by the research of neurodegenerative diseases. Every time I interview an expert in this field, they always say that above everything, medications, anything that you can take when you're diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, it is exercise. And, and they're not talking about just exercise. They're not saying you have to walk it. Absolutely but high not. intensity, you get it going. Not exactly. So there is, we've got two forms of exercise that's really important for brain health. We've got resistance training, which is weight training. And then we've got aerobic. Now, from the literature, what I've seen is that resistance training far outweighs the benefits of aerobic training. And this is specifically because when we do resistance training, let's take a bicep curl, for example. What's happening is our muscles- Did you notice it? You? Yeah. I didn't <laughs> it do any. Like I, 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 no, I didn't do any this morning. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, what happens is our, our skeletal muscles, they release something called myokines. These are muscle-based proteins. So they get released from the muscles, they go into the bloodstream, and then they go up, they cross the blood-brain barrier, and then they have an effect on different areas of the brain. And the biggest areas that it goes to first is the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is this little structure deep in the temporal lobes that is responsible for memory formations and consolidation. So it's pretty much the primary target of what goes first during Alzheimer's disease. And this is what happens. So when we release these myokines, let's just take one called irisin. comes from the Greek word uh, messenger to the gods, which was iris. This specific, it's a, it's a wonderful myokine and hormone. When that gets released, we have receptors on our bodies, on our kidneys, on our hearts. And when this gets released from the muscle, it acts on these endocrine organs and it has beneficial effects on it. We can't get this, we can't get irisin from any other way. 
So we, we have to get it from contraction of skeletal muscle. Irisin is just one. We've got interleukin-6, IL-6. When this is released, and this is a robust release, I'm not just talking about a little release, this robust release goes up into the brain and it has an anti-inflammatory effect. Inflammation is what's driving oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is what's driving neuronal death. So this is another reason to do a uh, physical uh, resistance training. So we've just got, it's all about the amount of hormones that's released. So so when you say resistance training, you're talking about like, you know, sort of, sort of saying, you know, got to go and do a bench press 100 kilos, but you are you saying lift a weight. What I'm saying is you have to lift 70% of your one RM to get the effects. Right. So it's not easy. And the one thing that I hate is when I see women in the gym afraid to lift heavy weights. And so you have to be lifting heavy. You have to be lifting 70%. All body? All body. Yep. Okay. If I had to suggest anything just due to time, just look at the compound exercises, your squats, okay, your deadlifts. You should be uh, you should be able to deadlift and squat your body weight. Mm. That's, well, and that's not a bad marker. So if you're – for me anyway, I think if, if you can't lift your body weight, chin-ups, obviously push-ups, squats, deadlifts, presses um, – you know, pulling a, a, the weight up to your chest, you know, like for your back. Um, they're, they're a pretty good starting point um, in terms of physical health mm. relative to exercise. Would, would that would that be? I mean, that's just an anecdotal thing for me. No, but that's when I feel best. Yeah, if I can lift my body weight, I get I get a bit shitty with myself. Yeah, no, that's that's absolutely right. And what we're seeing is that people are going out and they're looking for the cure in a supplement form. And I always say, unless you have what mother nature has given you, she's giving you the ability to exercise, it's free. The ability to sleep, it's free. And the ability to eat proper nutrition. You don't need to go out and buy supplements and do anything crazy until you can lift your body weight. Until you can lift your body weight, maybe in a pull-up or in a squat or in a bench press, you don't really need to go and start on anything else. Now I'm Every single day, I have a 20-minute argument with my parents, okay? I want to get them a personal trainer because I understand how important it is to do resistance training. It has an effect on all-cause mortality. You know, the number one uh, cause of death over the age of 80, if someone breaks their hip, they're, ra- they're, they're increasing their rate to dying and it's scary. So you want to be able to preserve things like muscle mass, strength and stability as you get older because you want to you want to minimize breaking of the bones and that's what we know you know sarcopenia osteoporosis as you get older it's more prominent so we you talked about the prefrontal cortex um Mm. earlier on which is a thing in the front of our head and let's say i i want to go down this territory if it's all right with you uh let's say that um i'm a rugby league player or i'm a boxer and uh, that's where I'm getting whacked um, yeah. and or I'm face planting as a result of getting tackled or something along those lines in, in footy. could be AFL as well. If the prefrontal cortex gets damaged, what are we looking at here? Is, oh, it, is, that, is that concussion? Look, when you get any – so a, a concussion is a blow to the head. It really depends on – rate at which you get hit, the speed, velocity. So that's what a concussion is. What I'd be most- Or uh, force and then the other words force. force. Yeah. Absolutely. What I'd be uh, more scared about is how many hits to the head have you let's, taken? Okay, let's take us through that because like it's not about getting knocked out once or having being knocked out once for whatever the reason. It's equally important as- how many times you got the little hits, the little taps? Yeah, those micro traumas, which yeah. is what it's doing. It's traumatizing the brain. You're creating neuronal death. And, you know, we've got around 80 billion neurons, 80 billion. But over time, they get less and less just due to things such as this. Age, does age do it as well? Oh, age does it. So, a- aging. what we see as we age is we have thinning of the cortex. So, we've got gray matter and we've got white matter. So, the white matter holds our myelinated neurons. Now, the gray matter, which is what you see on the outside, and that thins, that cortex thins over time. And we can see that through MRI scans. So, that's scary. One way to uh, mitigate that is through exercise because exercise has been shown to grow the gray matter of your brain. So, that's really interesting. We can do it with sleep. We can slow down Uh, neuronal death with sleep. But when coming back to your question, 
You've obviously heard of CTE. I know you had Chris on the podcast. Yep. Chris is fantastic. CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. He probably said that it's a neurodegenerative disease mm. characterized by multiple blows to the head. Mm. So this is why I'm actually extremely, it's very controversial. I'm against the NFL and something has to change when it comes to the NRL and the NFL, something has to change in the concuss concussion protocol. And what I think is that people aren't aware of the damaging effects that just one hit does. You know, and, the, and I think it's interesting. You're not saying that they shouldn't play the game. No. Because they're going to get hit or they might just put their head in the wrong place and just accident, accidentally get hit. What you're talking about is the protocols once you get hit. Correct. So what do we do once someone gets hit? Um, well, we look, it depends. First of all, how hard did you get hit, mm. first of all? But even, even but after that. It's very subjective that, though, isn't it? It's very subjective because we can't measure that on field. You can't just go and put someone in an MRI scan. But let's just say you got hit, you're out, you've been concussed. It takes a long time for your brain to really regenerate. And what so, they've- So yeah. and that's what the protocol's about. Yeah. Well, the regeneration period. Regeneration period. But sometimes that regeneration period, it may look like seven days, it may look like 10, and an NFL team is doesn't want their best player out for that long. Or an NRL side. So. Or an NRL, correct. Yeah. So what they're doing is they're speeding up that process and they're saying, it's fine. You can see, you can see two, you can see three. How many fingers am I holding up? You can get back on the field. And that's scary. Imagine going out with an open wound and then getting hit again. Yeah. You're just going to keep you know, hitting on that wound. So one of the the most crucial period of a concussion is in the first 24 to 48 hours, okay? It's called a post-traumatic insult period. And that is the most important. So th so many things need to take place. We need to have cooling down of core body temperature because when you do get hit, you've, your core body temperature, especially um, neurally, you're inflamed, it's heated, you want to bring that core body temperature down. How, how do you do it? Is it just time or well, cold or ice bath or what are we talking about? I mean, ice bath, yes. We can see this now. There's so many companies coming up with um, neck coolers, which would be hard. You really have to dunk someone in an ice bath at around three degrees Celsius. But it, look, it can happen. You can bring down the core body temperature that way. But what's also important is what you're having nutritionally. So lactate, which is um, the brain's preferred fuel, of energy. So that is all messed up. So they say that a ketogenic diet, post-traumatic insult would be the best diet to have. So that's- A, a ketogenic post, yeah. So yeah. No, no bread, no rice, no potato. Correct. So you just want maybe having um, a lot of ketones, exogenous ketones, yeah. for example. So there's so many things that are taken why, into why place. Is that, why, so does it, because I always thought your brain needed fats and energy and, and uh, it needs that's energy. That's what that is. Yeah. That, needs, and so that's it, is it? Yeah. So, so fatty, not fatty foods, but foods with natural fats. Yeah, like, correct. Like, but, yeah, yeah, or exogenous avocados. ketones. What, what does exogenous ketones mean? So it's a ketone. So a ketone is what your body produces. So let's just say you haven't eaten for a long period of time, yep. a day, okay? Your brain, this is why it's such a, a beautiful system. It has a backup system. So it says we're in survival mode now. We haven't got any glycogen stores. We haven't got any carbohydrates. We're going to produce ketones to keep our brain alive. So it produces these natural ketones and that is the that gives your brain energy. We can now get it in an exogenous form. So we can now take ketones. You mean a supplement? Yeah. Oh, that's from your So you're talking about a, a ketone supplement? Correct. Is it, that's just something you buy at the health food store, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, I take, I have a, a ketone drink that I take and um, you can have that and sip that throughout the day and it just gives you more energy. Um, and so that's great. And what these, do, what it does is it also crosses the blood brain barrier. So that can go into the brain and help you have sustained energy and focus for longer periods of time. Because I mean, I've often spoken to, I mean, I talk to him all the time, but Jordan Sullivan, the, uh, the fight dietitian who looks after all the you know, UFC world champions. And he keeps saying to me that in order to perform properly in the fight, um, you must have a certain level of energy, which and these people who just lose weight, drop weight to make weight um, and uh, like radically, it's just stop eating anything white, no bread no, and there's no sugar, there's, no, there's nothing with glucose in it. Um, he said to me that they actually have a – that has a, a pretty big negative effect in their ability to function properly in the ring when mm -hmm. they're fighting. Because mm. their brain doesn't work properly. Their brain goes dull. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't matter how good you look or how thin you look uh, or the fact you make weight, um, you're going to be ineffective. Yeah, that's exactly my thesis. It doesn't matter what you look like, what's happening inside. There's so many people walking around. They may look healthy, but I, I often wonder what's happening inside. And this whole nutrition aspect is important, especially as it relates to the brain. Now, I often talk about nutrients for brain health and I 
put my hand down when I say that the number one thing that we can be taking is omega-3 fatty acids. And that's not just for you or me or an elite. That is every single person should be walking around with a high circulating amount. Well, of, how much are we talking about? Like, is that that's, that's DHA and, and so uh, EPA? Omega-3 fatty acids, it comes from fatty fish, yep. mackerel, salmon. They're broken into three parts, EPA, mm-hmm. DHA, and mm-hmm. ALA. Now, the ALA is more the plant form. You can get this from flax seeds and from chia seeds. Avocado. Avocado. EPA and DHA is the ones that I really care about. These are the ones that can go into the brain and have an effect on the brain specifically DHA. Yep. Now we've got so many studies now to show the effects of DHA on the brain as it relates to Alzheimer's disease. You can slow down the progression of Alzheimer's disease and you can have the clearing out of amyloid beta and these plaques with four grams of EPA and DHA. And, and four grams, I don't know if that's a lot or not, but you talk about half a dozen tablets or is it just like whatever they prescribe on the back of the bottle? It's dependent and this is an unregulated uh, yep. place, okay, a supplement industry. Mm. You have to be really careful where you get your supplements from. The one I use, I only need to take three a day. Right. That's small, okay? And, you take, I mean, and I often wonder, are you supposed to take this stuff at night or in the morning? I mean, like when does it work? You should take it just before you go to sleep so it helps you out or? I take two grams in the morning and two grams at night. So okay. it doesn't help so you have a sleep. Each way. <laughs> I just look. I just so I'm not taking so many during the day. Yeah, yeah. But um, so with I take food, it with without food. food. Yeah, yep. I take it with food. So if I can like advise anything, they did this study on all cause mortality, and they found that there's 20 things that are related to all cause mortality: cardiovascular risk, etc. Did you know that omega three index, which is the measure of how much omega three in a red blood cell? That is now a form of all-cause mortality. So if you don't have a high omega-3 index, which you can now test for, you can increase your risk of dying prematurely. Isn't that insane? Well, therefore, you can, does it therefore follow that you can decrease your risk if you have a, the right levels? Correct. You can actually decrease it by five years. Yeah, so, okay, that's not five years. I'm well, increase your lifespan, I should say. It's a better way of, of putting it yeah. by five years by having a high omega-3 index of 13%. Right. Mine is 17% right now. 17 17, yeah. And and do you think that our health system doesn't allow us or doesn't encourage us to get baseline readings of our blood count for things like omega-3s? Yeah. Um, Like I don't think I've ever had a blood test for that. Although, you know, they send you for blood tests, tests for PSA and all those usual, you know, cholesterol, blah, blah, blah. But they don't ever look at these sort of longevity type markers. Yeah. Um, do you think our health system is letting us down a little bit in that regard? I do. Okay. But I, I'm going to caution what I say with the fact that you've got, we've got a wonderful healthcare here in Australia. If you're sick. If you're sick. Yeah. Okay. I'm talking about before you go, that. Exactly. But it's not built. It's, it's a Band-Aid method. It is once you get sick. Let's go to the doctors and yeah. let's just keep you alive. They're yeah. not checking for these other biomarkers. So we do a complete panel. We actually, You need around 16 vials of blood when you, we put you through what we put you through. And we're testing for things that cardiologists aren't even testing for. I told my father to go and ask his GP for an LP little A reading. And they were really, they were, why are you asking for that? You know, and it's a, that's a biomarker of cardiovascular disease risk. So these little things like, um, omega-3 fatty acids in Australia, at least you have to pay more for it. You have to, you know, jump through hoops just to get it. So this is the difference between the U S and Australia with the U S you can send away for it and do a blood sample. They can get it back that way. We don't do that yet. You can send it from Australia to the U S no, you've got to go to the U S yeah, you've got to be in the U S. So I do think that we're, um, I think that with education, we can get there. If you know, you can push your physician. Hey, I want an LP little A test. Hey, I want to test my omega-3s. Hey, I want to test my vitamin D. And I think that every every person should have free range to be testing these things. I know in uh, Northern Europe, they do vitamin D testing because they don't get as much sunshine there, especially during their winters. And it's a quite a, a big disease, mm. the vitamin D deficiency. Oh, yeah. Um, and we've only just been talking about in Australia during COVID period because it seems as though COVID, uh, vitamin D was some way they they thought would be of assistance in terms of, you know, beating COVID if, if you were going to be, get exposed or at least putting you in a more healthy position. What should an Australian do is listening to this now say to their doctor, okay, dude, happy to have the blood count, but my blood count that I want now want is 
how do they find out what they should be asking the doctor for? Yeah, well. In addition to what they normally get. Yeah, so for you want to test, okay, these are the things that I think that everyone should be testing. Ask for an LP little A. This is outside of the general yep. metabolic panel yep. that you're usually testing. LP little A, you want to test for C-reactive protein. It's a measure of inflammation. Try and ask for an omega-3. You definitely want to check for vitamin D, okay, if that's not already on there. And if you can, just start to assess your glucose. You can do this yourself. You can do a you can do a pinprick test every single morning and test your glucose levels. That's a really important. Why, why is that one important? Well, glucose. You know, the rate of diabetes is just going up, and I think the way that you assess metabolic disease, it all comes down to how well you can tolerate glucose. And that's another thing that a lot of people don't know. You eat something, you may be eating a banana, you don't know what if that's spiking your glucose levels or not. So we need to be doing this. We need to be checking for it. You can ask your physician to check for it. You can do an, uh, a fasting glucose test. There's so many things that you can be doing. It seems to me as though we need to revisit our baseline indicators for blood tests, not just blood tests but just general physiology, um, you know, like how someone looks, how they function, how they move, instead of just going to the GP and just he writes a prescription or a referral out, whatever it is, you go and get a blood test and he looks and he goes, oh, well, your cholesterol's a bit up or something like that, which is sort of, a, it's a bit uh, mundane. It's a bit um, banal, like it's real commonplace shit. Like it's yeah. just, for me, you know, like it's a, it's just average. I mean, I'm not having a crack at anybody, don't get me wrong, but I just feel as though these things, I know that you can do these things in America because I listen to all the Hooverman podcasts. I listen to all, I listen to all those dudes, okay? And uh, the stuff that you can get done there and and these all these very baseline um, indicators that you can get done, and there's apps and all sorts of things out there in the States at the moment, looks so far advanced. It makes me feel as though I want to go to the US and just do all the tests, Yeah. just visit, Yeah. just so I know what's going on. And then I'm happy to come back and live in Australia. I don't want to live there. But I, I just feel as though that they're so far advanced on, on everything. Yeah, and yeah. that's why I moved there. Yeah. So, for example, if you are one of our elite athletes or elite client that I will work with one-on-one, -on -one, we do two things to start with. We get you a complete DNA test and then we get you a complete. So it's a we look at your genetics. It's really nice to know what you're predisposed to whether it's Alzheimer's disease, whether it's cardiovascular disease, it could be atrial fibrillation. We can test for this now. And then that can then tie into what you should be taking. You may have a vitamin D deficiency, but then you also may have a, a gene that doesn't allow you to have vitamin D in your blood for that long. So we just don't know. So we have access to that. We can get a genetic test. Then we also do a blood test. So we then it's called precision medicine. We can then give you guidelines based on who you are. So it's not a one size fits, fits all. So that is what precision medicine is. But why, why haven't we got that in Australia? What, what's because we're deal? just not there yet. I'm hoping with this podcast and with um. But why aren't we there? I mean, is, is where's the resistance? Is the resistance at the administration level, like the bureaucracy level, or is it at the medical practitioners level? No, I think it's at the level of it's. Look, it takes 17 years to get an approval into a hospital. So do you know what that means? So what's that, that mean? How do you mean? So that means that if we figured out today, oh, there's something called MRIs. And we can now look into the brains and see how the brain is working. We can uh, we can find diseases and we can find how someone's had a stroke. That will not get approved. That MRI machine, even though we've seen it, okay, it's been FDA approved, it won't be able to get put into a hospital for another 17 but years. But why is it? That's just how it is. And that's just the, the, I think you've just got to pass so many laws to be able to get that into the system. So do you know what that means? That's scary. Imagine how many people's lives could be saved but just due to time, we didn't have it. So that's, I think, in Australia, I think in 10 years maybe or maybe in five years, you will now be able to work on a precision medicine standpoint. But at the end of the day, Mark, you and I both know it comes down to money. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm lucky I've been able to do it, to do some of these tests, but it costs a lot of dough. It costs a lot. And, and, uh, and, and, and I had to have connections to do it. I had to know, yes. well, it's not connection, but I had to know someone who did this. In actually my podcast, I, I got to meet someone who did all this um, looking for MND. They conducted a genetic test looking for certain types of mutations, but it wasn't cheap and it was only because he'd been on my podcast that I knew the dude. Yeah. Um, otherwise, I tried to get it done before this and I was talk, ringing in the Garvin. I, I, I was ringing all these institutions who look after these sorts of things in Australia. Like literally I couldn't get anyone to talk to me. But it's also population size. You've got – you're talking about – 
22 million versus 220 yeah. million. So they've got the they've got the money, they've got the technology, they've got the people, they've got the population. And over there it is a you have to pay for your um, health insurance. It's not given to you by the government. So it's literally you if you have I'm the buying, money. Give it to me. Yeah, exactly. And some of the stuff, you know, you could go get the complete metabolic panning, panel DNA test. You only need to do this once or twice a year, but it's $1000. But let me tell you, it's a it's 26 pages. It's a comprehensive report on you. Can Australians go to the US and get it done? Yeah. You just yeah. turn up, pay the fee, and you just turn it's up. done. Correct. And it's nearly worth, I mean, in terms of, you know, if you can afford it, it's nearly worth the trip, <laughs> to be well, honest with you. What they're doing now is um, they're doing whole body MRIs now. And I think that, that is both a pro and a con. It takes, it'll take you a few days, I think. It takes several hours to sit there and do a whole body, and it may show you things that you don't want to see. But it'll come up with everything. Is it the same MRI thing where you feel like you're in a coffin? Yeah, like that, correct. That kills me. I've done it, but it's like it's pretty not scary, but it's a punish laying in there for forty minutes or thirty minutes, whatever it is, about getting one part of your body looked at. I can't imagine getting your whole body. It must take hours, hours of sitting in this little tube. And everyone's different. You mentioned before that your friend doesn't want to know if they're going to get up. And I know so many people like that, but I'm different. I would rather live to 100, but not just live. I'd I'd rather be able to walk, talk, pick things up, bend down, get up off the floor at that age. So it's about health span and lifespan. Many people you talk to, they're like, Louise, I don't want to live to that long. So that's what they say. But when they're confronted with, they're about to croak and they're laying there and they're in the palliative care ward of some sort of hospital and then someone's saying, look, you only got days to go. Then you start to say, fuck, hang on a minute. I might take that back. I wouldn't mind getting a couple more years. Yeah. I, I think that's that would be my mentality. So I'd rather know now and live with the knowledge that and do everything I possibly can to at least drag another couple of years out here and there. And uh, and it would make me, if I found out something, it would make me actually probably focus on some other things in my life that I need to focus on as opposed mm-hmm. to just carrying on my merry way doing what I've always done. Yeah, and the question you have to ask yourself is, how do you want to live the last 10 years of your mm. life? If you knew, okay, that you had, that you were going to die at 90, how do you want to live 80 to 90? Do you mm. want to live in a bed, in a hospital bed, or would you mm. rather be able to think, have conversations, remember things, remember to get your keys, maybe drive down to the local store? Is that how you want to live? It's so it's everybody is different. So that's where the starting point is. How do you want to live your life? And most people that I interact with, everybody wants to live a high-performing totally. life, health span and lifespan. So you've been in Australia. What were you doing in Australia? Were you doing talks or going around seeing clients or what were you doing in Australia? Here? I was and then I realised that the population wasn't here. I really wanted to look at – I really wanted to use EEG scans, mm. which is what I do now. So I wanted to use that on athletes. I wanted to figure out what is their visual acuity? Can I increase their visual acuity? What's their information processing speed? And what is their overall brain functioning? So EG is measuring the brain waves, so certain brain yeah, waves, yeah. correct. Um, electroencephalogram. And so that's what we do now. So we have our own hospital grade EEG that spits out a 13 page report on how well your brain is functioning. And we do a complete brain map. So we can figure out, you know, that it gives you a normal Based database. on stimulus, you mean? Based on stimulus. So yeah. you'll be looking at a checkerboard. So you'll be doing a reaction test while yeah. it's on, eyes open, eyes closed. It scans your brain. This is what you'd do if you had epilepsy or a seizure. Yeah. You'd go in and yeah. do an EEG. We can now do this from a performance measurement standpoint. So I can look at one of my MBA players and say, great, you've got complete visual acuity in the left eye, but the right eye is not functioning well. Let's correct that. That may mean to everybody, that may mean nothing, but to LeBron, that could mean the difference between uh, $22 million or $122 million. Because if he can just increase his uh, points each season by 20 points, that's huge. That's, that's money in the bank. That's money in the bank for and, him. And then you're going back to New York and you're going to run this business in New York and looking after athletes yeah. and looking after high-performance people in business as well? Correct. Yeah. So do you go and pitch to them or they come to you? Well, when I first moved there, I was making 200 calls a day. I yeah. was really hustling hard just like you would generally do when you're starting a business. It was crazy. And that was 2016 till around 20. 21 really. And then that's when things started to get a bit viral for me on social media. So, and now I have a team. So now people are coming to me. Um, but now I'm about to take on major league baseball, which is a, a right. whole new field for me. And I have to ask you this, um, if you don't mind, um, I'm a, a fan of, uh, Huberman lab. 
Uh, what's the dude like? <laughs> He's wonderful. Um, I'm actually seeing him on Tuesday night. Next week. Next week uh, or Wednesday night. For yeah. those who may not know who he is, it gives a bit of a, a thumbnail. And... So Andrew is a neurobiologist and ophthalmologist at Stanford School of Medicine. He's an a ophthalmologist guy. being an eye expert. Yeah. But a, a, a neurobiologist being someone who understands the biology of the brain, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. and evolutionarily. And um, he's wonderful. So I remember uh, talking with him uh, pre Joe Rogan. And I remember him saying, Louisa, I love, you know, the phone call. He goes, but I'm, I'm just letting you know something is about to happen with me. And I thought, what is going on? And then within like, you know, a week, he went from 12,000 followers uh, after Joe Rogan to about 50,000, then a hundred thousand. So he's wonderful. He's uh, providing zero cost education to the world on high performance habits, how to build better performing brains and science-based tools. Yeah. He's, uh, I listened to something he talked where he was talking about meditation the other day. Um, it's more, one of his more recent podcasts. They do go for a long time, um, <laughs> but I did manage to sort of get through it over a period of time and uh, I, I found it quite intriguing and uh, got me back to doing meditation again or short-form meditation um, when I get a chance during the day. Um, he's quite a – he's a real influence in terms of what an influencer should do. It influences you to do things that are better for yourself Yeah, and makes you, you, know, makes you better. And mm-hmm. in, in, in it seems as though he just has this – addictionally or obsession to improving the way we live. Yeah. But in every in every sense, physically, etc. Yeah. And he's just he's he's just loved science and he's been doing this obviously for so many years. We actually um, are on the board together of a company called Momentus. And what does that do? So Momentus is a supplement. At the core of what they do, they've got the highest best form of supplements that they've got triple certified We're doing supplements. Supplement, brain supplements or oh, they've everything. got everything. Yeah. Every type of supplement that yeah. you could think of. Um, so he sits on the scientific board as do I. As an advisor. As an advisor. We so both is, advise. is that like on it? Uh, similar? It's similar, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I've tried some of the on it stuff um, maybe because I, fo- I follow Rogan and uh, and I just see some of the stuff he does with him. I presume he's involved with on it, Joe Rogan. Oh, Joe Rogan's, yeah, yeah he's, he owns a, a large stake in on it. Yeah, right, because yeah. uh, and Joe's into this sort of stuff. I mean, he's not a scientist, but he's into this sort of stuff. Oh, as he's well. wonderful. He's so into this. You'll see him with in a sauna, ice bath. Ice baths are amazing. I think you should get a cold plunge if you haven't got I have one. one. You've got one. I've got a plunger. Yeah. What is? I've got the- a, not a plunger. I've got a. Uh, I've got the New Zealand one. Um, I can't think what it's called, but it's like a blow up thing. But it's quite rigid, and it's plastic. You can hook it up to a machine that actually produces the cold water. Um, but at this stage, I'm, I've just, I just put it ice in it. So what's the temperature that you get to? Uh, I get down to, well, I, well, I can get it down as long as I want, but I've been getting down to eight degrees. Okay. That's perfect. Yeah. Because what we know from- Eight and eight. I'm doing eight minutes at eight. Well, the literature on um, cold thermogenesis. So when you do get into this bath and if it's eight degrees Celsius, you only need to stay in there for five minutes. Yeah. If you're doing that, you get a 530% increase in norepinephrine. Right. That's, okay. Yep. That's incredible. Yeah. That that's, well, it, it does make me feel better um, to be frank with you because I, I mean, I get inflammation for, from exercise and all the sort of training I do. So, but so uh, I always find it's a, a great, and I, I see our footballers, our, I'm, I'm on the board of a, a well-known Sydney football team and our footballers are always doing the, the cold baths or straight yeah. after the game. They okay. always go and cool down in the bath in the ice baths. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in infrared too. So uh, I, I do the infrared and then, I, then I'll then i do the cold baths as well. Love it. If you could, yeah, that's honestly, you've just described my performance studio. Infrared sauna, cold plunge. I also have a tonal, which you set up on the side. And it's What's like that? A, it's like an at-home uh, resistance training oh, right. machine. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I go to the gym, do the resistance stuff and and uh, and, I, and, and I do a bit of wrestling because I, I, I think the uh, – the jujitsu is a great sport um, in terms of strength um, because it requires quite a bit of strength, but no, no head. On your head. on your motoring your own disease yep. path, did you so you tested for that? Because this is, sorry, this all ties in. You yeah. tested for that, and you were tested negative. Well, that's right. I didn't test positive for any of the hundred markers, and they're having categories. So there's a hundred odd or or so known genetic mutations yeah. that are associated either directly or indirectly with people who have had motor neuron disease according to this data set that this particular organisation has, which is quite a big data set allegedly. So I didn't have any of those markers. It doesn't mean I that there's one they haven't discovered yet that I do have, um, but for what they know right now and they have the – because they keep your genetic data, 
when these new ones come out, they can actually come back and tell you, look, there's a new one, Mark, and you, you know, you're in okay. that category. Yeah, because it's that's the ALS is what they call yeah, it. ALS, in yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a it's seventy percent, I think, is sporadic, or is yeah. it eighty yeah. percent? Which is so scary. I'm I'm only eliminating genetic. Yeah, the I'm familial, familial which one. is 20%. I'm not I'm not eliminating what can be sporadic. Yeah, it has nothing to do with say my mother or father, um, but that has a lot to do. As I understand it, that has a lot to do with um, external or the way you live your life as well. So like uh, everything, yeah, yeah. You know, so all I can do in those regards is exercise, sleep, and have good nutrition. Yeah, there's not much I can do more than that. Exactly. Um, other than be aware of the symptoms, I guess. But uh, it, it, and I mostly did it not for me to be honest with, you, like to uh, the genetic one, just to know where it doesn't stop at me or does it go beyond me to my kids and my grandson, my grandson. So that was pretty important for me to do it from that point of view. Um, and I, I just found it to be a, a good intellectual exercise too. It was, yeah. it was fun. To I'm know, like I, it's knowledge to me is really powerful. Yeah, exactly. Because once you have it, then you can know, well, what can I be doing? And when it comes to Alzheimer's disease, whether you have the non-genetic form or whether you have the genetic form, 70% of all Alzheimer's disease patients or people have the non-genetic form. So that is very scary. Mm. So we're literally walking ourselves into neurodegenerative diseases through lack of sleep, lack of proper nutrition and lack of physical activity. So if that doesn't ring true for people listening, then I don't know what will. Well, and I think I think the the lesson out of all this, and I know it's really good that you came on, Louisa, to talk about this stuff. But I think the lesson out of all this is, um, just get with a program <laughs> and start to become a bit aware and educate yourself, and just stop living in a bubble and and start to think about and research. Like go to your Instagram, go to your podcast, go to. Huberman, go to whoever. Just look at these things, start to think about this sort of stuff and, and build up an awareness. Then you might start to think about, well, how, then reflect on yourself. How am I living my life? And is there something I can do to improve my future? Mm. That That's, it's pretty simple stuff. It's pretty simple. Outside yeah. of genetics, you do have, a, genetics. A, and it's, you have the power to do whatever it is that you want. You can walk yourself into disease states or you can walk yourself out of them. Now, that's very interesting too um, and you say outside of genetics because a big percentage of this stuff is outside of genetics of all, a lot of these brain diseases at least. Um, but that has – no one's been able to show you but I'm sure I just instinctively think that lifestyle is a big part of that, how you live your life. And that's what you mean by you walk right into it if you live a shit life. Yeah. One thing is for sure, if you live a shit life, you're drinking all the time, you're smoking, you don't exercise, you eat shit, you don't – not only you eat shit, you don't have the proper nutrition, mm. proper nutrition, mm. you know, aware nutrition, then you are walking into it. Mm. If you have all those – if you do have good nutrition, you do exercise, you might not be walking out of it, but you're definitely not walking into it. Well, what we call it in medicine is delaying the onset of these diseases. You can delay it by five years, 10 years. You can't really reverse these neurodegenerative states, but you can starve them off by several, several years. One thing that is really paramount is that when you are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, let's just say it's in your 60s, you, you have had Alzheimer's disease 20 years before the first symptom arises. So we could all be walking around now and in 20 years we could be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So you're 20. So these people who are like, I'm young, it doesn't matter. Your brain is fully developed by the age of 25. So it does matter. What you do in your 20s, what you do in your 30s will have an impact on how your life is in your 70s and in your 60s. I was explaining to my sons, I wasn't quite that scientific about it, but I was explaining to my sons, what you do in your 30s is what you're going to be feeling in your 60s. Yeah. And if you want to be a, a good father or a good grandfather in your 60s, then think about what you do in your 30s. Oh, absolutely. Then right now it's really important. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you one more thing and it's just a, it's a curiosity of mine. But um, in terms of getting baseline reads on your blood or what's going on in your brain, can you get amyloid levels tested to see whether or not you are not clearing shit out of your brain and that, that this, is, this is accumulating in the compound system that you referred to earlier. 
such that it gets to a dangerous level? You can't routinely go in and do that because no. the only way to assess how much amyloid is in the cerebral spinal fluid is with a spinal tap. Okay, so you've got to get someone to pull spinal fluid yeah, out. Yeah, and that's a, a, you're never yeah, going to no, get no, no, approved no. for that just yeah, as yeah. A, a measurement. So you can't do a blood test or something? No, yeah. but what they have done to actually show the relationship between sleep and Alzheimer's disease is they took a group of rats, rodents, and they sleep deprived them. And what they found after a week, they did a spinal tap. They got the cerebral spinal fluid. The ones who slept six hours a night, as opposed to the ones who slept eight or 10 hours, had higher amounts of circulating amyloid beta in their cerebral spinal fluid. So we now have associational evidence, which um, in epidemiological studies, a lot of physicians don't like associational evidence, but we now can see in clinical data, clinical meaning humans, that there is a very strong correlation between sleep and Alzheimer's disease. So That's very interesting. Yeah. Louisa, thanks very much. It was awesome. Thanks for having me, Have a good trip. Thank you.